Welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to TwitWow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John, that's my cohort and commentary, Ashton, and this is our Monday Night Raw Review, the Ho Ho Hogan edition. And I've got to say, for a Christmas episode of Monday Night Raw, this was surprisingly good, far superior, at least in my opinion, to last week. And you all know how I loathed last week, so I thought this was a major step up. Um, I still don't think any major implications for the Royal Rumble presented themselves, aside from what we already knew. I mean, no new entrance for the Rumble match had been announced or anything like that. But still, as a standalone episode for the holiday season, this was quite fun. Definitely a bearable three hours. What did you think, Ashton? Well, let me tell you something, brother. It was eh. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that really just this, about this, sums this, it up. This episode of Raw was kind of just there. Like, it wasn't amazing, it wasn't offensive, it just existed in the realm of any and all holiday specials on Raw. And I could do with it, I could do without it, I really don't care. If I had to give it a score on a scale from 0 to 10, it would be a 5. It was just like right down the middle, no cares given. Yeah, I can completely understand where you're coming from, bro. Uh, so with that said, let us get right into uh, our well, SmackDown recap. Actually, right? but before that, I actually did just kind of want to say, uh, since it seems like Raw is phoning it in for the rest of December, I would be perfectly okay if you would want to kind of speed through this, get it done in under an hour, and pack things up, and then for next week as well, and then we'll get back to doing legit, like, hour and a half, break it up into parts, that kind of stuff for YouTube on uh, January 5th. And apparently they're going to be starting a pretty big angle on that Raw too. So, Sounds like the perfect Christmas gift to me. So do you want to just forego the SmackDown recap then and all that stuff and just get straight to the well, review? Well, I mean, for what it's worth, the, the, the really mentionable stuff that happened on SmackDown got either shown or repeated on Raw. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, really the most notable thing from SmackDown, just to touch on that very quickly, Dolph Ziggler finally beat Seth Rollins one-on-one, which yeah. I thought was really cool for the uh, for a mid-card champion to do, uh, especially considering that it is Dolph Ziggler and the guy he beat is Seth Rollins, who holds money in the bank, and, you know, whether we, we like where he's going currently or not, he is in more of a main event position uh, compared to other people, so I thought that was very well done. But, uh, but yeah, other than that, I really don't know what else to recap, so I, I guess we could just, uh, you know, get into our actual segments pertaining to Raw. Well, and, and on top of that, for what it's worth, SmackDown last week was also live on Tuesday. That's right, yeah. It was, it was a live yeah. Super SmackDown, so, yeah, I mean, not really, not really much to say there. And um, I, I'll, I'll just say right now, as far as heat of the night is concerned, I really don't have any, because like you said, this was, eh, this was middle of the road, I wasn't really offended by anything, so did you have any nitpicks or heats of the night tonight? Uh, no, I mean, it, it, to me, the, the thing that I got the most butthurt about was Cena beating Seth Rollins despite getting help from frickin', uh, what's his name, the two nerds, J&J, J&J security. security, yeah, those guys, we said it at the same time, that's how linked our brains are, but, uh, but yeah, like, I, just this Cena went full ham, and, and to me, the other reason that I'm not complaining about it is because it is a Christmas special, and they want to send the fans home happy and all that junk. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, it's no use even picking it apart, it is what it is, I mean, if you guys have been watching Cena's career like we have, this kind of thing has come to be expected, you know, Christmas edition or not. You know, it's standard. It's par for the course, as, you, as they say. So, with that said, let us just get right into our Monday Night Raw review. And Can we'll I ask you a question, John? Yeah. Do you want to build a snowman? Sure. John Cena sang Frozen tonight. That's why I'm asking. I, I know. And for the record, I haven't seen the movie. I have no plans to see the movie. I know everybody yeah, else. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I've seen it. It's It doesn't live up to the hype at all. And, and the problem is, Ashton, there was so much hype. I couldn't yeah. get away from it. So. And, and, and yeah. the worst part is, I like, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Frozen, fast forward 30 seconds. But when Elsa sings Let It Go, it's basically her turning heel. Yeah, I think I remember you even commenting something like that. So, yeah, we got John Cena singing that. 
We got Hogan doing his usual shtick. Uh, he does say that Big Show's going to go one-on-one with Roman Reigns, and Bray Wyatt's going to face Dean Ambrose in a Miracle on 34th Street fight. Uh, Seth Rollins comes out, pretty much does his usual stuff. I mean, not to discredit Rollins in any way, but he says, oh, we need the authority and power. Dude, uh, Rollins has gotten so good on the mic, and really just so good as a heel. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. He really is, I think, one of the top heels in the company. Because, again, we've had this debate about Rusev. How can you uh, consider a man that takes care of his business like he does a legitimate heel? So, you know, he brags about how he beat John Cena, you know, last week. Uh, says that I, I guess he would be on more of a role, you know, with Survivor Series and the Authority still in power if it wasn't for the Vigilante Sting, which, side note, I'm not crazy about the nickname, but whatever. Dude, they have – they literally, if you go back and watch every episode of Raw for the last month, not a single time does the name Sting get said without being preceded by the vigilante. Right. And I'm, I'm really just not crazy about it at all. But It's, it's almost whatever. as bad as Big Red Eric Rowan, but they realized that that wasn't going to work and dropped it like it was hot. Kind of wish they would have dropped this a lot faster. Yeah, I know, right? It's ridiculous. But, you know, he just goes on his usual stuff. Oh, the authority should be in power. They still would be if it wasn't for Sting. Then he goes on, you know, I beat you last week, John. Ha, ha, ha. And then, you know, Cena pretty much just tells Hogan, hey, you know, the one thing I want for Christmas is because Seth Rollins beat me. I, I want a rematch with him tonight. Uh, Ho- Hogan grants it. Seth is, is livid. He keeps running those two guys down, says, you know, you guys are taking up the ring, but this is my time. I'm the new standard bearer. I'm better than both of you. And so we have our match set for Cena Rollins, which turns out to be our opener. Yeah, uh, dude, that was awesome. I love that they actually let this go on first because it was like, okay, well, now we know that either Reigns or Ambrose Wyatt are going to main event, which means that we're getting a Shield member. Well, I guess Rollins would have too. Dude, that's the thing. Like, there were four noteworthy matches tonight. Three of them involved former Shield members. Because the Shield runs raw, baby. That's how it works. Even when they're not together anymore, that's still true. Which, you know what, even regardless of what you think about Reigns or anybody in the Shield for that matter, I think is a really good thing. Because it shows that the faction worked. Its aim was achieved. And you know what? I dig it. I really do. Um, so, yeah, we open up with Rollins, Cena. And, well, I mean, like we said, Cena does get his win back. But you know what? It was another solid match. You know, between this match and the match last week, I wish these guys would have just had a match like that at TLC. Because, I mean, they really can have phenomenal matches together. They've proven it time and again. I yeah, they, they can have phenomenal time. matches, John. But I saw last week as Rollins getting his win back. So you can't get a win back that somebody else already got back. Yeah, yeah, it's... John it's, Cena it's, has now beaten Seth Rollins twice in eight days. I know. <laughs> and and you know what? I still stand by that. I think and, Seth Rollins is uh, one of the better booked briefcase holders and all that jazz. Yeah, but, but I mean, in, in, in reality, even though Rollins technically did beat, quote-unquote, beat John Cena last week, it took both goons, Paul Heyman, Brock Lesnar, and he still didn't get a pin. He still ended up winning by escape. So he didn't actually beat John Cena. He just won the match by technicality. Yeah, this protection of John Cena, I think, is ridiculous. But you know what? We Like we said, we just want to go on through. This is the Christmas edition. John Cena conversation can happen any other day of the week. Yeah. Uh, so tonight, John Cena does get the win, and that's it for him. And then we go on to – what was our next thing, Ash? And I believe – was After was the, the Cena-Rollins stuff? Yeah, what was after Cena-Rollins? Uh, it was Swagger Fandango. Oh, yeah, and you know what? I got to say, this is the pleasant surprise of the night for me because Fandango won the match. I I love the new and improved Fandango. I don't care what anyone says. Like, people crap all over it because, oh, the only thing that people ever liked about him was his theme music and you took that away. Yeah, that's the point. He's a heel. You're not supposed to like anything about him. I love it. I love it, too, and I'm glad to see that it's getting back on track because you know how much it ticked me off that Roman Reigns pretty much cut off his momentum when I loved what he was doing last week, you know, building up to that. So it was great to see him getting the win here tonight. And the only reason I didn't think he was, I, I guess I forgot that Swagger's feud with Rusev was done at TLC. I still thought that maybe he was going to have beef with him. So I thought Swagger was going to get the win. So oh, yes. dude, Rusev has moved on to Ryback. I know, man. I know. The we'll get big to that guy. Later. Yeah, and we'll get to that later because I actually quite enjoyed that segment as well. Yeah. But yeah, Fondango gets the win after his leg drop. And, you know, Fondango can brag about beating the, the last guy to challenge for the United States Championship. So go Fondango. 
Yeah, it's just unfortunate that Fandango is nowhere in the realm of possibility of challenging for the U.S. title right now. I'd love to see him and Dolph have a mini program, like just one of those TV matches for the IC title, if anything else. And by the way, I will say this. For the longest time now, I have been absolutely insisting that United States Championship is the WWE's most prestigious championship behind the WWE world title. I think that the U.S. title and Intercontinental title have kind of evened out, but not in a bad way. Not in that no one cares about either one of them way, but in a they both mean a lot more than a regular old mid-card title. It's just for different reasons. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, Rusev is just so dominant and he has that legitimacy when he wears the belt, whereas Ziggler, I think he's got the story and the personality to really make the championship. Yeah, and if we're being completely realistic, it might even have gotten to a point now where maybe the IC title has overtaken the U.S. title a little bit, uh, if for no other reason, just because Ziggler is kind of making an like almost like a lower main event level push right now, like between the being the sole survivor at survivor series and, and not necessarily main eventing, but being in the featured match on all these shows, it's, it's starting to feel like the intercontinental title is kind of the, the semi main event now, whereas the U S title is the special attraction. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you're saying. I really can't add anything to the discussion there because my sentiment's exactly concerning the uh, current state of the mid-card championships, and it's great to see. So, you know, Fandango does get the win. Let's hope that he could be a future contender for Ziggler, even again if it's only one of those one-off TV championship matches because I would really enjoy that. Um, the New Day uh, – well, actually, no, no, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. My apologies. We see Tom Phillips have an interview with Dolph Ziggler. Uh, he asks Dolph about having to face Luke Harper tonight. Uh, Dolph says the ladder match was one of the most brutal matches I've ever been in. It was tough physically and mentally. He called Luke Harper a nightmare come to life. That's putting someone over right there. Really like that. Uh, but Dolph said, hey, don't sleep on me either. I'm a four-time Intercontinental Champion. There will not be a Christmas miracle tonight. He will give the fans what they want, and he will steal the show. He tells Luke it is too bad that he is too good, and he wishes Phillips a Merry Christmas, and we go to commercial. And up next, we had the new day video package that you were just about to talk about. Yeah, it's so weird that this got here, seeing as how we've already seen them on TV. Dude, do you want to know why I had nothing to say about this? Why is that? I'm convinced that they were just like, oh, we need to fill two minutes. What do you want to do? Uh, do we still have those new day packages? Yeah, we do. But everyone's seen them already. Well, who cares? Just play one. Yeah. Pretty much. Like, uh, they, they didn't want to play more than two Ascension vignettes tonight, so they said, ah, screw it, let's just keep the new day in people's minds. Yeah, it's actually, that sounds pretty reasonable to me, so way to go there, production team. Anyway, we move on from that to our third match of the night, Adam Rose versus R-Truth. Not really much to talk about here. It's it's worth noting, you know, he comes out with the Rosebuds, the bunnies wearing a neck brace, uh, selling the attack on Kane from the week prior. Uh, not really much going on in this matchup. R-Truth does get the win, uh, I think after a roll-up, because I, I think he blocked one of Adam Rose's offense maneuvers and, yeah, gets the win. Uh, but the real story here is in the post-match. I think Adam Rose has finally severed ties with not only the Bunny, but potentially all of the Rosebuds. He beat the living hell out of the Bunny after the And matchup. it was amazing. And you know what the best part about this whole thing was? What's that? The yelling that he was doing was literally exactly a Leo Krugerism. I know, dude. I, dude, I am telling you, if that is the payoff of all of this, I will have been so grateful to have taken the journey. Yep. Because like, am, am I going to sit here and be hyperbolic and say that Leo Kruger has main of that potential written all over him? No, even though. But he does. I was going to say, even though part of me does genuinely believe that. I'm just saying, given the saturation of talent, I'm trying I to think be that realistic. The way, the way that I've explained it uh, pretty much since Adam Rose debuted on the main roster was that Adam Rose is fun and entertaining, and I don't want to take that away from him. But his ceiling is like mid card champion, but still like comedy style champion. Adam Rose is, as far as ceiling goes, though, that's that's ceiling. Right. Leo Kruger's ceiling is main eventer. Yeah. Now, yeah. I'm not saying Leo Kruger is going to become a main eventer anytime soon, but as far as ceilings go, which is, for those of you that don't understand that that term, it's basically the best that anybody can be in the perfect situation. And 
the ceiling for Leo Kruger is main event. Without question. I, I absolutely believe in the ability of Leo Kruger. I mean, just the idea of him going after a, a Dolph Ziggler or just anybody within that tier just gives me goosebumps. And then moving on to the main event or targeting somebody like a Cena or an Orton, you know, because he's the Viper and, and Kruger's that hunter. Dude, just, I have like, been throwing out ideas for, I want to say over a year now, talking about how Leo Kruger should start dressing up like Craven the Hunter and go after animal-themed wrestlers like the wild cat Kofi Kingston or the the Cape Town werewolf Justin Gabriel or back when they were still around the Funkasaurus people and the freaking yeah the, the, and it would have all kind of culminated in the Viper Randy Orton because he's kind of like the top animal themed gimmick yeah I dude if they go to Leo Kruger it has so much potential it is ridiculous and I uh, yeah. I know this is this is really contrived and I know it's not actually going to happen but how great would it be if they literally just took the vignettes that they played on NXT where he was just laughing and talking about how everything you know is about to change and just played those on raw yeah, you know what? Let, let him take some time away. Let him really reflect, and then you can make him, you know, repackage him with those vignettes. Uh, we gotta, we gotta get the tooth pull though. We, we do, we do. Maybe. No, see that that's way too convoluted. But I might as well put what? it out there since I thought it. I was gonna say maybe next week the rosebuds try and have an intervention with him. He kind of blows his lid, rips his tooth out, and then honestly, dude. I would keep him off the product until after Mania, reintroduce him with the vignettes. and then After start- Mania? I was thinking, yeah. like, maybe, like, after Rumble. I would want to keep him off for an extended period of time. Maybe that would be enough time. But I just Yeah, like, why are, we, why are we talking about that much of a break just because you want people to erase the, the memory of Adam Rose? Uh, yeah, I, well, well that- we didn't need to erase the memory of Leo Kruger, the African prince, before Leo Kruger, the crazy hunter, debuted. Yeah, that's true, but then again, that's NXT, and I have more co- I have more faith in them to competently get somebody in without them having to take an extended break. Um, but I, I think we could make this work, sure. I mean, just as long as he took a step away, kind of like what Orton's doing now, this way when he re-enters, people are like, oh, what's this? You know, just really something big. Uh, regardless, I hope it happens, but in the present, he beat the crap out of the bunny, and it was good. Yeah. So... With that said, we uh, we come back. It's announced that Hulk Hogan will be the GM for SmackDown this Friday. Man, I wish I cared. And then we go to Big Show versus Roman Reigns. Um, both of these guys have box and box promos. Uh, Big Show starts telling a Christmas story, but then he says, "Ah, forget Christmas. You know, I have a present for Reigns. It's not a stocking stuffer. It's a face stuffer." Ooh, sick burn. Uh, Roman Reigns also had a box and box promo, and he said that the holidays are all about the spirit of giving, so he is going to give everything that he's got to the big show tonight. Both are just so wonderful, aren't they, Ashton? Yeah. Yeah, um, not really much to say here about this match. I will say that I like that Big Show actually seemed to give Roman Reigns more resistance than the average competitor. That actually let Big Show's heel dominance kind of impose itself in the matchup. But, I mean, I think everybody knew that Roman Reigns is going to come away with the win. The only question was, how was he going to get this win? And the answer was apparently by count out. You know, they tussled. I think that the the number one thing that wrestling fans hate most is the feeling of inevitability. And that's what Roman Reigns feels like. It feels like it is just inevitable that he's going to go on a run, win every freaking match, and magically beat Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. And I think that even if they still plan on giving Reigns the title, I think that the WWE would be best suited to just change it up enough so that people don't find it so predictable. Even if, like, if you want to give Reigns the title, let somebody else win it at WrestleMania and have him beat them at Extreme Rules just to break up the monotony and the predictability and, like I said, that feeling of inevitability. Or hell, dude, even if they want Reigns to, to go on a little bit of a run and then maybe he hits, like, a major block. I mean, just for argument's sake, mind you. I'm not trying to paint any picture of what I think is actually going to happen. And you want to put Cena in his way, and then maybe it looks like Cena's got Reigns beat and he finally does that heel turn that I know you've been asking for and I think others have been asking for. You know, just do something, then what I'm expecting is going yeah, to Yeah, to me, like... If you want to save Roman Reigns' career, if you want him to become an actual top babyface, more like The Rock than like Cena, 
where Cena, yeah, you can call him a top face all you want, but he still gets booed in half the vicinity or the venues you go to. You need to turn Reigns heel. He needs to have a heel run. He needs to a get out of this, get it out of his system, and b do it just to stay fresh. Because, I mean, at this point, even if you feel like it's not the best decision to make, you need to do it just so that you can say that you did it while Cena was still in his prime. Because Cena being around gives you that kind of leeway. If you're never going to turn John Cena heel. Turn the next coming of John Cena heel to save his career. I completely agree. In fact, if there was one thing I could change about my example, because I think people would love if Reigns, you know, compromised his uh, his ethics to beat John Cena. I wish uh, we would have Ryback built up enough where he could be a viable challenger and then do it to him, because Ryback is crazy over, as was proven tonight in yeah. his segment, which we'll get to. Yeah, tonight's um, crowd, they started out hot for Hogan, but they were really dead for most of the night, and I think that the biggest reaction anyone got other than Hogan himself was... Ryback. Yeah, Ryback and I think Mizdow were two of the hottest guys on yeah. the show tonight. Yeah, but even still, Mizdow, like, the the chance for Mizdow were a lot fainter. Yeah, Ryback, I think, definitely. Where, yeah, Ryback. like, with Ryback, if you heard, it was feed, me, more, and in between each word, you could hear a pin drop. There was no sound between the words. It was just feed, complete silence, me, complete silence, more, and it was unanimous. It was crazy. Yeah, I, I'll talk about Ryback a little bit when we get to his segment, but Roman Reigns does beat Big Show by countdown after a Superman punch sends Big Show over the announce table, which <laughs> yeah. makes me dread that these guys are going to have a rematch at Rumble. Or oh, you know it. Yeah. No, you know what? You know what? See, that's my thing. I think the WWE likes to let these kind of little feuds play out during the Rumble rather than having extracurricular matches because typically the Rumble card will have three matches plus the Rumble, maybe four if at most. I hope it doesn't come down to Big Show and Roman Reigns in the Royal Rumble so that they can make Roman Reigns have this great moment about eliminating this giant over the top rope. Uh, I think we'll probably get Cena Lesnar, a Divas match, and a tag title match between Miz Dow, Miz, and the Usos. And those will be the only matches that we get other than the Rumble at that pay-per-view. Yeah, I would have to agree with you there. I mean, but... they might squeeze one more in there maybe maybe they'll even do adam rose versus the bunny but i yeah they usually like to say they usually start the rumble itself at like 9 45 10 o'clock yeah so we go from that to uh renee young with dean ambrose and uh, yeah has, this was awesome yeah this is so adorable she asked dean about his preparation for his match tonight Dean says he's been preparing all year because he has been a really good boy. He went to see Santa at the Mall of America. He might not have seen Santa, but he saw a security guard with a beard. He said that all he wanted for Christmas is Bray Wyatt. Tomorrow he gets him, and he says every time a bell rings, Bray Wyatt gets a beating. And then he wishes Renee a happy holiday. It was adorable. <laughs> so, yeah, good, good stuff from Dean here. Uh, Even if they weren't a couple, which it's a rumor, but we can't know for a fact until we see or hear definitive proof. So I, you know, I remain skeptic on that, but even if they weren't a couple, it was still adorable. Absolutely. And, uh, so we go now to Brie Bella with Nikki Bella versus Natalia with Tyson kid. Um, and TJ. Yeah, I know. Right. The best thing about this match. And, and no, I'm not even kidding. Um, yeah, you're right. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty basic divas match. I, I really can't remember much about it. I know Brie, I think tried to Matt Russell Natalia, but good luck. Cause a heart is no pushover for any of that crap. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately I, I, that's, that was the finish. Natalia, I think countered an inside cradle. She reversed the pressure and she got it. And Natalia ended up pinning Brie. Uh, and then after the match, Tyson actually celebrates with Natalia, and Natalia, being the wonderful baby face diva that she is, Nikki tries coming into the ring, maybe to be a good sport and shake Natalia's hand. You know, we'll never know. See, I was thinking she was trying to get into the ring to tend to her sister, who is still laying in the ring. Yeah, or that, you know, just, just being a good person. And Natalia immediately gets the jump, and she pretty much knees Nikki Bella out of the ring, takes her Divas Championship, and holds it high above her head. And if that wasn't bad enough, now it just confirms for me my nightmare. I'm going to have to choose between Nikki Bella and Natalia, so, and I can't believe I'm saying this. Go Nikki. Go Nikki Bella. Yes. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. Anyway, after that oh. nightmare, um, we get... 
a gr- I, I don't know if this is the second one, but either way, I think we can talk about both just in the context of wrapping this one up. Uh, we get an Ascension video, and Ashton, they make it known they're coming next week, bud. Oh, it's going to um, be... Yeah. See, but here's my thing. Why in the world would they debut on the New Year's special? Well, you know what? To be fair, I, I, I feel like they always try and make a, a big deal out of the first Raw of the New Year. I yeah, mean, that's in two weeks. Oh, two weeks. Oh. Oh, next, yeah, you're dude, right. Dude, next Monday is the 29th. Oh, crap. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, they should have waited for the first Raw of 2015. Exactly. I would I would have been totally cool with that. I would have actually applauded that. I wow. would have preferred that to this. Yeah, that's so weird. I mean, I now, I, I don't know. I'm still excited for their debut, no doubt about it. But, yeah, that that's a weird booking choice. Um, and you're still hoping it won't take long for them to be the new tag team champions. So Yeah, I'm beginning to really kind of accept that they're not going to win the titles on their debut. Yeah, that that's certainly not happening. But, I, you know what, I haven't entirely ruled out them winning the titles at Rumble. And I'm being serious about that, so we'll have to see what happens. Um, but yeah, they are coming next week, and I'm super excited, I know you are too. So we go from that... Gold Dust and Stardust, they had another uh, box and box promo. Stardust is singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and then he complains that he only works one night a year. Gold Dust says that he will make sure that mutant's nose is red when he is done with him. He wishes uh, They wish everybody a Feliz Navidad. And then we go from that to Gold and Stardust versus uh, Los Metadores, which includes in that packaging El Torito. So it's a two-on-three handicap match. Um... And yeah, Michael Cole match. didn't even realize it. Yeah, I know, right? Cole was just like, "Well, I guess that," uh, and they, it wasn't El Torito tonight; it was El Reno. I guess El Reno is just gonna stay on the apron up there, and then JBL is just like, uh, "Michael, it's two on three. <laughs> First of all, plus five for the JBL impression. Second of all, is it just me being egotistical, or, or am I right in believing that you and I have done commentary's job better than they have lately? Because <laughs> it's just Dude. really bad." Yeah. A team of monkeys could do a better <laughs> job than these guys. Yeah, I know. It's it's so sad how truthful that is. Um, yeah, nothing really wrong with this match. The ending actually comes with uh, El Reno pinning Goldust after a lion salt, to which Abel had the comment of the night on Puitoff. He said uh, El Torito's beaten more people with the lion salt than Chris Jericho has in 10 years. <laughs> so, uh, way to get it done. Los Metadores, they win. And... I'm I'm still got my money on a tag team turmoil esque match at Royal Rumble, so we'll see. But uh, we go from that to a Luke Harper promo, and I think you actually really like this, didn't you, Ashton? Or what did you think about it? This was perfect for Luke Harper because it was really creepy, but it was so good. Yeah, you know what I like? It had that creep factor, like you noted. But I liked how simple he kept it. You know, he wasn't trying to go for any poetic or flowery verbiage like Bray Wyatt's been known to do. It was very direct. Uh, he says it's the time of year where people like to give things, but not him. He likes to take. He likes to take things away. And tonight he is going to give himself a present. He is going to hurt Dolph Ziggler, and he is going to take the Intercontinental Championship. I just felt like this was such a perfect by-the-books promo for him. So Yeah, really it was really solid. This. Yeah. And what was even more solid, in my opinion, was Luke Harper versus Dolph Ziggler, a return bout for the Intercontinental Championship. The biggest point in this match, and really all I want to personally add in there, and then I'll hand it to you, Ashton, Luke Harper looked like a monster in this match. I loved his booking in this match. Yeah, Luke Harper is consistently amazing. But I I feel like they really stepped it up a few notches with him because there was one point in this match, guys, where he was setting up for the lariat. Dolph Ziggler super kicks him in the face. Harper eats it, and he still connects with the Lariat. Just absolutely phenomenal how much of a monster they made him look like. And it should be noted, it should be noted that he beat the crap out of Ziggler before the bell even rang. He got the jump on him. He even nailed a side slam, that uh, swinging side slam that he does on the floor. Got him back in, so it was almost reminiscent of the first time Luke Harper won the Intercontinental title. Uh, Ziggler said, you know, ring the bell. And, and so you have that whole dynamic. But, yeah, Harper, he had powerful kickouts. There were times where he looked like he was, like, sitting up and, and quick to recover from offense. Like, he looked like a legitimate obstacle for Ziggler to overcome, and I really admired that. In my opinion, 
this match should have been the main event tonight. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. I felt because like these guys killed between, it. between the fact that Wyatt Ambrose ended really stupid and the fact that this actually had something on the line, this was an Intercontinental Championship match, and the fact that this match ended with that feel-good moment, this match should have main evented this show. Now, let me ask you, first of all, I do completely agree with you, but there's something I have to ask you before we move on to our next segment. Are you fearing that Ziggler is becoming a, a bit too strong, or are you liking no. his booking right now? Overcoming no, because here's my thing, dude. I I agree that this was a moment of uh, slight... And, and you know what? No, I'm not even going to say that. To me, Ziggler is only now beginning to appear as strong as he should have been appearing for all this time. Z- Ziggler has been criminally underrated, underbooked, underused by the WWE for the better part of the last four, maybe even five years. And he's finally starting to get credit. They're finally even starting to acknowledge that he's trying to turn himself into the guy. Like they're actually using that term, the guy. And I, I can't find a way to justify saying, well, Ziggler's getting too OP now because Yes, he ate a lariat and kicked out, but he had the oomph in him before the lariat to deliver a super kick. And even if you want to say, oh, Luke Harper no sold that, you can still reasonably say that the super kick at least took some momentum away from the lariat. Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. To I me, just... what made this match great was that they didn't do obnoxious crap to try to protect both guys. Dolph Ziggler won clean. Luke Harper still looked like a beast. And Luke Harper didn't need to get any extra little jibs and jabs in after the match is over like Dean Ambrose did in the main event. And it just, this match, to me, was A, match of the night, and B, should have main evented by miles. And letter C for me, and I don't know if I'll get in any hot water for this, I thought this was leagues better than their ladder match at the pay-per-view. Yeah, oh my god, yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I thought this was great, the storytelling, again, with Harper being a monster. But my concluding remarks, I don't want to get into that discussion, because I think that could be better for another episode of uh, of Twitwell or a special commentary between you and I. To me, Dolph Ziggler is the square peg in the round hole of WWE right now. I don't even say that in a bad way, because I just cannot pinpoint where this guy is going to end up at WrestleMania. Like, I really, I know I said John Cena had one of the more intriguing storylines going in, but now I think that's shifted to Dolph with his recent booking, because I have no idea where he's going to end up, and I'm just really enjoying the ride. Yeah, like, to me, I could buy Dolph Ziggler, as far as WrestleMania goes, ranging anywhere from being the semi-main event to not even being on the card. You know what I'm going to say right now, and I, and I know it may sound ridiculous, but I, I'm just going to come out and say it. You know, if they are going to do it again, because it was supposed to be an annual thing, maybe Dolph Ziggler will be the second ever winner of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I could totally buy that, too. That You know what? I'm calling it. I'm going to say that's what Ziggler does. As of this moment right now, and it could change, but I think he's going to win that, because I can't see where else he would end up that would be reasonable at this moment. So, yeah, that's going to be my spot for him for the time being. But uh, where he is right now is in the ring, and Jerry Laura comes in to congratulate him. Ziggler cuts a pretty basic babyface promo, says he pulled it out because of all the people. Uh, he's scratched and he's clawed, and, uh, you know, to get this title, and he's going to be damned if anybody's going to step up and take it away from him. So, really great to see Ziggler in this spot. Uh, you know, he definitely deserves this, and I'm just so happy for him. Dolph is in a place right now where he is becoming the right kind of over. He is... When he's in a rest hold, when somebody else has him in like a headlock or a reverse chin lock or whatever, crowd starts chanting for him and he plays off of that. He is the right kind of over right now. He's not, oh, as soon as the bell rings, people start chanting, let's go Ziggler, Ziggler sucks. And obviously that was a jab at Cena, but he's not in the position where people chant his name just because he exists. He is at the point where people will cheer for him when they feel like he needs their help. And that's the best kind of over to be. That's where Daniel Bryan was September of last year. 
Absolutely. Uh, sky's the limit, I think, now for Dolph. If he can just stay healthy, and that's not a jab towards him. I just know freak things happen and freak things have happened to him before. So if he can stay healthy and he can stay the course, I don't think there's any limit to what he can accomplish. I know you asked me earlier today in conversation before we recorded, do I think Dolph will be WWE World Heavyweight Champion? And I'll, I'll be honest, I said no, and I will still say no, but I want Dolph to prove me wrong. So let's go get it, because I'd love to see it. Yeah, so. I, mean, I think that really what it comes down to is right now, looking at the playing field, I think really what I want to say is there's no way they're going to have Dolph Ziggler beat Brock Lesnar for the title. But if you would go from Lesnar to Reigns to, to Rollins, I could totally buy Dolph beating Rollins for the title. Yeah. I just, I really feel like anything can happen. I mean, I mean, I think Rollins right now is the X factor with that money in the bank, and if he does cash in successfully, I think Dolph's odds just kind of skyrocketed. Because given their history, I can definitely see Dolph finding his way into that picture because he has that history with Seth Rollins, and he even owns a victory over Seth Rollins now. So, right. and and realistically, just looking at the way WWE works, the most likely thing that they would do is. Uh, have Reigns win the title back from Rollins if they would do that, but if they would have like in d- during like in the, during the, in the middle of that back and forth between Rollins and Reigns, if they would have Dolph Ziggler challenge for the WWE World Title, I would completely be able to buy him winning, and it would probably be a match of the year candidate because of that. Absolutely, yeah. I, you know what? Just you saying all that to me and us having the back and forth, I am so excited for the 2015 of Dolph Ziggler. I think he's going to be the guy that we're all watching very closely. I feel like you and I, one or the other or both, have said that every year since 2010. I know, uh, but but you know what? The funny thing is, I think this year there's actually some legitimacy to it, really, because given his survival. Remember, <laughs> remember in, what was it? 2012, maybe I think it was when Jim Ross said that if Dolph Ziggler and Cody Rhodes aren't champions by the end of the year, they should just quit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, it's, well, I can't say it for Cody Rhodes. Cause I mean, look where he is, but Dolph, I don't know. Things are finally looking up, so we'll see. But for right now, we go from that to Piper's pit. Uh, you know, he, he does a pretty good intro saying, you know, it's the holiday season and he loves being here with all of us. Um, he says his two guests are, are two people who asked to come down here because they have a special Christmas message for all Americans. And of course, Rusev and Lana come out. Uh, Roddy keeps talking, but, uh, you know, he says, I like to get, then Lana cuts him off and says straight to the point. She says, Christmas in America is a joke. It is a one time that you Americans pretend to be good people. You put on your fake smiles and your phony holiday cheer. You believe in a bloated man who delivers gifts to your spoiled children. God, I love you, Lana. Every I know. Week. Lana was spitting facts tonight, man. I'm telling you, man, if she just got rid of the shut up and kind of heightened her rhetoric a little bit, she would be one of my favorite talking heads on the program. Well, see, uh, and I, now I just want her to team up with, with Tyson Kidd and just spit facts at everything. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but um, Ronnie stops Lana and says, you know, this is the land of the free and we can believe what we want to. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Ronnie. Um, and then they look at what they did to Ryback on SmackDown. Uh, Rusev asks if you believe that he can crush your Ryback. Crowd chance for Ryback. Again, great crowd to the babyface, especially guys like Ryback. Uh, Rusev then asks if they believe that he can crush Piper. Uh, and then Roddy, you know, kind of stops him right there. Says he's full of Christmas joy and there's no need for you to be a bunch of communist Scrooges. And he got Rana and Rusev a gift. And he says they're really going to like it. There's even a bow on it. And out comes Ryback with a bow on his chest. Yeah, and this was pretty cool. I mean, it was corny was... as all hell, but it's WWE during Christmas season, so it was expected to be corny, and it was still cool. Yeah. Uh, Ryback comes down, him and Rusev brawl. But, uh, I, yeah, Ryback actually caught Rusev with the spine buster. He, he blocked uh, Rusev's thrust kick and, and scored it. He was going to set up for a lariat, but Rusev was able to get out of the way. And then Piper raised Ryback's hand. I'm telling you, man, I feel it. If I'm right about this, I think Ryback's going to be the one to end Rusev's United States Championship reign and just totally get this streak out of the way so Rusev can just be a monster in general and gun after Cena. I, I'm feeling it. I think this is Ryback's time, so we'll see. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've really been kind of salivating at the idea of a Ryback Rusev match. And I love that even though they're having these little like tit for tat interactions, I love that they haven't had a full on like full contact fight yet. 
Yeah, save that. I wouldn't even have it until the pay-per-view. Make people want it. Make people want to see this collision. So, you know, with that, we go to, uh, we actually go to our Divas match. We get some highlights from Cena and Rollins, but then, yeah, we go straight to the Santa's Little Helpers uh, tag team matchup. It's Alicia Fox, who's babyface this week, Emma, who actually got an entrance, and Naomi versus Paige, who was the most over woman in this match, Summer Rae, and Cameron. And, you know, not a, not a bad match. I mean, I actually had some fun with this, especially when Paige was in the ring. I can't wait for Paige to get back on the radar and get back to a better place within the division. Uh, Emma got some fun offense in here, too, which was so wonderful to see because you know how much I love her. And, yeah, in the end, Alicia Fox actually got the win for her team with her cool-looking finisher, which I don't even know how to describe it. So Emma, Naomi, and Alicia Fox get the win. You have anything you want to say about this match? I don't know what to call Alicia Fox's finisher either. It's like a leg drop DDT almost. Yeah, it's really weird. I like it, but it's really weird. I don't even know what to call it. Yeah. Um, you know, we go to that. We get our second Ascension promo. We already talked about that because they do announce their arrival next week. Then we get Miz in a box and box promo, and he says... That Dude, these box and box promos were obnoxious tonight. I know so many of them. So many. Uh, he says that, you know, he's been so charitable with Naomi that he's going to give the same honor to Mizdow. He wants Mizdow to sing for him, but before he can, Miz stops him and says, ah, we're out of time. And then we go to Miz versus Jey Uso. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to level with everybody. I was kind of taken out of this match. I really don't even really remember that much, but I know Mizdow was, again, the most over aspect of it. And I believe Miz did get the win. I think he got a handful of the tights. Yeah. And he ends up beating Jay Uso. So I can't believe this, but an Uso is actually beatable. Granted, it was in a one-on-one environment, but still, Miz does get the win. So, anything you want to say about that, or do you want to move on? Well, let's see. No, I think we can move on. All right. We go, and Bray Wyatt starts speaking to the audience. Uh, he starts to sing, it's the most wonderful time of the year. He says he couldn't help but notice that people like to be surrounded by everyone they love on the holiday. That got him thinking why. He believes that people surround themselves with loved ones because they feel safe. Bray asks us all if we feel safe. Uh, Bray says that he hates to break it to all of you, but your safety is an illusion. A facade to shield you from the truth when you look out the window. There is a different world. There is no Santa. There are no sugar plums. This is the real world. There is only pain, suffering, and sorrow. Bray says that in his world, a world that he thrives in, in this world, he is king. Really like this promo. Bray is just, just so good. And uh, Bray says that he has taken Dean Ambrose to his world once before. Before your very eyes, he is going to once more. You too can feel this joyant moment beside him. All you have to do is look to the sky and follow the buzzards. And then we get our main event. Uh, what did you think about this, Ashton? The, I believe, third You know what? It, here's my thing. Was this a bad match? No. But did I care? Again, no. We've gotten three stipulation matches between these two guys over the course of the last eight days. I'm done with it. I get that they have good chemistry in the ring, but nobody cares when you see it three times over the course of eight days. More importantly, the big kind of, oh, oh my goodness, OMG, the big spot of the night, Dean Ambrose coming off the turnbuckle and, and doing his elbow drop onto Bray Wyatt onto the table after everything was said and done with. He did it three times off of ladders eight days ago, and one of them was onto the announce table. Why am I supposed to care about it when he just does it off of the turnbuckle onto a regular table? Yeah, I think the problem with this match is exactly what you said. I think they've exhausted all of their creative possibilities, you know, in a special stipulation type arena. I just want these guys to stop focusing on each other and start focusing on the Rumble match, or at yeah. least other And matches. that's another thing. The crowd does not give a crap about this match, and it's not because they don't care about either guy. It's because it's the exact opposite. It's because they do care about both guys, and they don't want to cheer when either one of them gets beat up. Yeah, 
I mean, I have to credit these guys, right? Because I think they did try and take full advantage of their stipulation. They did utilize their environment. It's just at a point where nobody cares for that reason. They like both guys. They want to see both guys at the top or at least, you know, top tier. And they don't want to see them on this collision course with each other where they're going to be forced to choose. And it's here's like, my thing, dude. Ambrose was obviously supposed to be the baby face going into this match, right? Right. Crowd starts, well, Bray Wyatt throws Dean Ambrose into a tree, and the crowd starts chanting, one more tree, one more tree. Bray Wyatt, being the dis, the, the the terrible, evil human being heel that he is, proceeds to do what the crowd is asking him to do and throw Ambrose into the final tree. Yeah. Like, how is this supposed to get either guy over? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Like, really, all of your concerns that you had going into this program, I've really begun to see, like, as these matches have unfolded, and I just can't wait to get past it so we can get on to something new. Um, there was one great teaser spot. You know, Candy Cane, its its uh, its end part was set up in the corner, so it looked like one guy was going to put the other guy's eye out, but both of them avoided it. Wyatt scored a Coles line. That was a cool spot. In the end, I, I think Bray won after a, a kendo stick, you know, wrapped to look like a candy cane in the head, and he got the pin. Yeah, he didn't it, even beat him with Sister Abigail. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a kendo stick shot. And uh, he goes over to, to Ambrose for more, but Ambrose does the extinguisher in Bray's face, sets him up on the table, and he gets the elbow drop, and that pretty much concludes, you know, this Raw. You know, I don't mind... Dean Ambrose losing again, I guess, because, I mean, he did win at Tribute to the Troops, but at the same time, you know, you give him that moment post-match, but how is that going to help him as a babyface? If anything, you know, you could say that he was defending himself, and I'm sure that argument holds up, but, I mean, he still lost the match. It's kind of like Ryback when Mark Henry beat him at WrestleMania. He gets the shell shock post-match. Well, it doesn't do anybody a lot of good when the match is over. Um, so yeah, that was pretty much that show. And then we go to credit. So not a bad raw again, as we described in the beginning, it was eh, middle of the road, nothing offensive, but, uh, I'm glad to be done with it, especially because next week edge and Christian will be the guest GM. So hopefully they get a lot of segments so that we can, uh, really see them play off each other and we can all have a good time. So with that said, we move on to our next segment, high spots and low shots. And I got to say my low shots I am going to say Dean Ambrose. You know, this is presumably the last encounter. But, John, he got comeuppance at the end of the match after the match was over because he dropped an elbow on Bray Wyatt through a table. Yeah. Don't you yeah. see? They're both strong. Please believe that they're both strong, John. <laughs> I know, right? But uh, this is presumably the last match between these two, and Ambrose came out on the losing end when he said all he wanted for Christmas was to just beat Bray Wyatt, which I guess in a way was achieved in his own perverse way, but, you know, if you're going to be, you know, one of the top baby fans, well, actually, no, I guess I shouldn't say that, because, I mean, Cena wins all the time, and Roman Reigns wins all the time, so, actually, maybe Dean Ambrose losing as frequently as he does is one of his greatest strengths, but still, you know, I'd, I'd like to see him more big-time matches, if possible, and, uh, you know, didn't get the job done here, so he's going to have to be my low shot. So, my question now is, who was your low shot, Ashton? Cut and dry, Seth Rollins. He opens the show up with a solid promo, but promptly gets told to shut up because the adults are in the ring. Not literally this time, figuratively this time, but he has been told that literally by Cena before. And then he gets put into a match, which he can't even win with the help of J&J security. So, yeah, Rollins, low shot, not even close in my opinion. Yeah, uh... This is a really interesting development. I mean, we've said that the Shield is kind of running the show, and yet two uh, members of the Shield have taken our low shots. So, yeah, not the best time. So does that mean that Roman Reigns is going to be your high spot to make up for it? No. No. <laughs> uh, but you're absolutely right about Seth Rollins. Just a I tough think we might him. have a unanimous high spot tonight. We might. Uh, let me just get right to it. My high spot was going to be Dolph Ziggler. Yep, unanimous, baby. <laughs> yeah, I mean, had a great intercontinental title match. Like I said, better than their TLC ladder match for me by a mile. Love the story with Harper being a monster and Ziggler having to overcome being beaten up before the bell even rang. And just great stuff all around. Ziggler retains, so it seems like he's going to be holding this championship, presumably for the long haul. I'll be very interested... Uh, 
you know, in his performance at the Rumble and what he's going to do ultimately at WrestleMania. Again, I've already got him pegged for winning the second uh, under the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, but plans, of course, can change. So, since you said it's unanimous, uh, is there anything you want to add on to what I've said? Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I just, Dolph had a great night tonight. I think Dolph had one of the more eye-opening nights tonight because of the fact that he had that support from the crowd and they were so consistently in his corner. And a lot of the time when you put two guys that are both really exceptional in the ring together, the crowd starts to kind of get split, kind of like what we had tonight with Ambrose and Wyatt. But as amazing as Luke Harper is in the ring, the crowd was thoroughly in Dolph Ziggler's corner tonight. And he won the title. Well, he retained the title. And it was just a really, really great night for Ziggs. Definitely. Without question. Uh, with that said, we can get right into our next segment. Raw request. Um, and, and, you know, my raw request, I, I hope Edge and Christian get uh, quite a bit of screen time. You know, you do it with any other guests that we don't care about. So I hope they get some worthwhile segments next week because uh, I love those two together. So my raw my request request. is if the Ascension have to debut next week, make it a serious debut. I want them to beat the Usos next week. That's what I would love to see. Just establish You know they're going to beat the Matadors, right? <sighs> I'll begrudgingly accept it. But Usos Just would really make a splash. The Usos get protected. I know. I know. Um, I love your raw request, though, by the way, because, yeah, Ascension's debut next week is going to be very important. So, I mean, with that said, there's only one segment left, and that's 30-second hot seat. So what do you have for me this week? My 30-second hot seat for you this week is very simple. Uh, and it's not even uh, 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 something with a right answer. It's an opinion thing. Okay. Whose theme music would you freak out most to hear during the 30-man Royal Rumble? You have uh, seconds. Your time starts now. Yeah, you know what? I think I would freak out the most for Tyler Breeze. Yeah, if Tyler Breeze had an appearance, I think I would go crazy because Tyler Breeze is amazing, and I've been looking for him to really get back on the map in a major way, and I think being a surprise engine would be just the way to do it. So, yeah, Breeze for Royal Rumble 2015. Wow. Yeah. I, I, well, your 30 seconds is only up now, so you did a great job of keeping it under that, but that wasn't really like, it wasn't really a head scratch. I wasn't trying to make it hard on you, but I I think it's harder on me though, because I'm torn because I want to say Finn Balor because that theme and, and it wouldn't be an elaborate entrance either. He would just come out. It would, they would sell him like a million bucks. Well, it's commentary, so I can't really count on that, but hopefully they would sell him like a million bucks. He would, he would maybe eliminate one or two people. They would get all pissed because the, the rookie eliminated them. It would start something. I really just want him to show up between now and like February for the sake of him having an entrance at WrestleMania. Yes. <laughs> That's ever it. since yeah, I think ever since our evolution, all people can think about is Finn Balor's very first WrestleMania entrance because it is gonna be all kinds of epic. Yeah. So But then realistically, if I'm if I'm thinking people that are actually likely that, that might that have a chance at showing up at Rumble, the first person that comes to my mind is actually Adrian Neville. But then yeah. I, I get scared because reports have been coming out that they want him to be Mighty Mouse and that's just horrible. I shuddered when I read that today. I don't even... You know how it would... The only way to me that that could work is if by Mighty Mouse, they mean they're literally going to put a mask over his head that has, like, fake ears on the side. Yeah. And it's it's horrible in that they're trying to turn him into a mouse, but it works because his best shot at getting over is with a mask. (laughs) And we've talked about that, but why... Why that kind of mask? I already feel so bad for him, and he hasn't even debuted yet. Because, like, if you think about, like, Phoenix. Right. He's not, like, he doesn't have, like, any any over-the-top features. He has the little, like, thing on top of his head, but that's not over-the-top. Or Drago. Like, he doesn't actually dress up like a dragon. He just has cool spikes on his mask. Or, right. you know, like, guys like that. It's it's cool that they have like the animal themes, but how do you make Mouse look badass? And that that was going to be my thing. The biggest difference between that and Phoenix and Drago is those are badass animals. Those are cool animals. Oh, we're gonna make you Mighty Mouse, Adrian. Uh... I, I think I think I'd rather stay down here at NXT. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's funny, because Gravity finally did recognize him in the form of his push, because he's just going to stay on the ground the whole time with crap like that. The man that creative forgot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, But good answers all around, and with that said, do you have any concluding uh, remarks about this Raw? And another one I wanted to say, if Daniel Bryan's music started went for like five seconds and then cut out and we got bad news Barrett. Oh God. They should have done that last year. I know. And I'd love for them to do it this year. Yep. Oh man. I, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's my, that's my spiel. So now that we both got our stuff in, you can go ahead and close us out. Absolutely, guys. This has been Raw. This has been TwitWow. The best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John. That's my cohort and commentary, Ashton. Guys, be sure to comment and discuss on YouTube uh, and subscribe. We've really been loving the feedback. It's just been wonderful seeing it on all of our newer stuff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, be sure to also discuss on Tweetov an amazing pro wrestling group, of which we are the tag team champions. And we will see you again for a holiday edition of TwitWow with our NXT review, as we're going to find out who Kevin Owens' next victim is going to be. Hopefully. See you there, guys.